This episode was made in partnership with the Kavli Prize. The Kavli Prize honors scientists for breakthroughs in astrophysics, nanoscience, and neuroscience, transforming our understanding of the big, the small, and the complex. The phrase surface level usually means something at least mildly insulting. If something is surface level, it's superficial. It's not interesting. Well, there is an entire field of science that begs to differ. It is the science of coding a thing with another thing and making that thing do something wildly different. These coatings are called monolayers, because each layer of the material is just a single molecule thick, spread out over a surface. Coating glass with certain monolayers can make it easier, not harder, to see through. And that's just the start. From TVs to pacemakers, from engineering microscopic circuits to studying and controlling the behavior of cells, we are here today to show you that surfaces are more than skin deep. Some optical, electrical, and even biological processes are easier to deal with on thin surfaces than they are in big, bulky volumes. Think about painting complicated designs on a canvas compared to sculpting something in the round. You can more easily manipulate stuff on that flat plane than in big blobs. That's true even for tiny stuff, and layers can be a great way to manipulate things down to the scale of nanometers. Scientists first got a handle on monolayers in the early 20th century after noticing that certain kinds of glass actually transmitted more light when they were tarnished. It all comes down to how light waves transmit and reflect off surfaces. If a wave of light heads straight toward a pane of glass, most of it will go through the material, but some small amount will also be reflected back. That reflected light makes up the glare that can make it harder to see through. One way of dealing with this is with a film, as in a thin layer of material rather than the theatrical movie kind, although we will come to those in a moment, too. If you put a transparent film at precisely the right refractive index and width on the glass, it lets incoming light enter the material as normal, but it has another effect as well. Light will be reflected from the surface of the glass like before, but it will also be reflected from the surface of the film. Now that sounds like it ought to increase the total amount of reflected light, making things worse. But this is the part where we remember that light is a wave with peaks and troughs. If the film is just the right width, the peaks and troughs of the reflected light from the glass and the reflected light from the film interfere and align to cancel out. In short, the film actually winds up with getting rid of the reflections and reducing the glare, which makes the glass super clear and transparent. It sounds convenient, but creating these films isn't easy. And that was the problem facing scientists around the 1930s. Enter star physicist Catherine Blodgett. Building on the work of her mentor Irving Langmuir, she developed a process involving a chemical reaction between acids and other compounds inside a container. After the reaction, a film would form on the top of the liquid solution consisting of a thin layer of something called cadmium arachidate. This is a type of molecule with one end that dissolves readily in water and one that doesn't. Blodgett's process lined them all up neatly across the water, pointing all the same direction since the water-loving ends would end up facing towards the water's surface. If a piece of glass was dunked into the water beforehand, you could carefully pull it out so that the film, just a single molecule wide neatly transfers itself onto the glass. It's a little like pulling out a strawberry from a pot of melted chocolate so it's all coated evenly. After that, Voila, you got yourself a layer of molecules on a piece of glass. The resulting films are actually called Langmuir Blodgett monolayers, or LBMs, named after their inventors. The specialized container used for creating them is called a Langmuir Blodgett trough. The trough, along with the method they used for lifting monolayers out intact, is what allowed them to apply LBMs onto solid surfaces like glass. By repeating this process as many times as needed to get the right thickness, Blodgett managed to create a film of material on glass capable of reflecting less than 1% percent of white light falling onto it. That made the glass amazingly clear and was extremely useful. For example, glass developed using her process produced crystal clear lenses used for movie projectors in the late 1930s. The same kind of lenses were even used in the periscopes built for submarines and spy planes in the Second World War. But Blodgett and Langmuir's research on monolayers wasn't just confined to glass or even a particular chemical process. Using Langmuir Blodgett troughs with different chemical reactions, researchers could apply even molecular sized layers onto materials for all kinds of uses. Basically, a kind of Swiss Army knife of nanoscale engineering. For instance, you might be familiar with OLED TVs or computer monitors. They use organic light-emitting diodes to create a picture, but they're pretty inefficient, especially the blue kind. Because of the crystal structure inside the OLED, the light kind of bounces around inside of it before escaping, getting absorbed by the material, and losing energy instead of coming out as visible light. But if we could control the thickness pattern 
pattern and shape of the OLED layers, we might be able to make them more efficient at releasing light. A 2016 study by French researchers found that constructing these layers with LBMs did make them super efficient, and that by carefully tweaking the different layers, they could even understand why. Which means LBMs could help us save energy when using those big ol' screens we like looking at so much. But as incredible as LBMs are, they're not always the best way of neatly arranging a layer of molecules onto a surface. In some cases, they're chemically unstable on the surface they're applied to, meaning they won't stick around in their organized, layered structure for long. And what's more, using a langmuir blodgett trough can be a slow and delicate process. It only works on flat surfaces, and it's one and done. No tweaking once you've pulled your surface out. But as is often the case with chemistry, there is more than one way to arrange an organized layer of molecules onto a surface. You know, as they say. By 1946, chemists had seen that in some cases they could simply dunk a surface into a solution and have the molecules arrange themselves onto it in a neat layer. In 1980, chemist Jacob Segev at the Max Planck Institute in Germany showed that it was possible to create monolayers on certain kinds of surfaces without all that messing around with a water trough. In Segev's version, the molecules in the solution were individually attracted onto the solid surface, sticking themselves onto it in a particular direction. Direction. In a short amount of time, they arranged themselves into a monolayer, firmly stuck onto the material. In fact, by mixing and matching specific molecules and organizing different surfaces, it was possible to create patterns, something you could not get with the pull out the strawberry method. Since these monolayers assemble themselves, they are called, no awards for guessing, self assembled monolayers, or SAMs. Segev's work on SAMs was a huge step, allowing him to create monolayers on a variety of surfaces, specifically, solids with a layer of oxides on their surfaces were especially well-suited to the process. That might seem super specific, but lots of materials exposed to air react with oxygen and end up with oxides on their surface. So the ability to make SAMs on them opens a lot of doors. For example, this made it possible to make electrical circuits at the nanoscale, as in technology that's only dozens of molecules or so in size. Using SAMs, Segev was able to create monolayers that could conduct current through them, which is a crucial step for engineering electrical circuits that are only a few molecules thick. Which you would want for things like transparent displays or smart contact lenses, things where you don't want the electronics getting in the way. But while this works for things like electronics, SAMs would have even more potential if they could be put onto materials without oxides, like bare metal surfaces. Well, a few years later, in 1983, the chemists Ralph Nuzzo and David Alara reported in the Journal of the American Chemical Society that they had created a SAM on a surface of bare gold. These kinds of SAMs were a game-changer. Like Blodgett and Langmuir had shown 40 years earlier, covering a surface of a thing with something else can vastly change what you can do with that thing. The SAMs, based on Nuzzo and Alara's design, could be made from lots of different organic materials and made as precise as a few atoms in width. Researchers have since used them to change the electrical properties of metals, make them more resistant to corrosion, and, in particular, study biological processes. See, long Long before humans got into the molecular engineering game, nature was chock full of microbiological processes carrying out different functions at the nanoscale. That's basically what life is. And a lot of these happen at some kind of boundary, like the surface of a cell. Which makes SAMs a great model system for studying such processes. For instance, in one 1991 study, German researchers embedded molecules of biotin onto an SAM, which itself was bonded onto gold. In nature, biotin has particularly strong reactions with a protein called streptavidin, which plays a key role in biochemical processes. The SAM basically gave the researchers a nanoscale hot bed for studying the chemical interactions between the two in a well-controlled way. As well as studying nature, researchers also quickly realized that they could use the microbiological tools it provided. One instance is what's called a DNA microarray. These are a sort of fancy chip with a lot of DNA stuck on them. Since a strand of DNA will connect with its complementary strand, a microarray can tell you how much of that complementary DNA is present in a given sample. Like the level of certain genes expressed in samples from patients who do or don't have a particular sort of cancer can be very different, and so a DNA array can be a kind of genetic magnifying glass to help us diagnose a patient. Early on, SAMs were a promising way of creating microarrays like these because they could be used to hold a bunch of molecules, like DNA, in place. The challenge, and it's a big one, was placing each strand of DNA in a particular location on the array, since you have to know what location on the chip corresponds to what DNA sequence, which meant 
finding a way of creating SAMs with specific and intricate patterns. By 1992, a team of Harvard researchers led by the chemist George Whitesides had cracked the problem using what's called soft lithography. The solution was basically drawing a particular pattern onto gold with the substance that the SAM would be made out of. That laid the foundation for another idea. Instead of drawing it out, they created the pattern they wanted on a kind of stamp, covered it in the substance the monolayer would be made of, and stamped it on the surface to create an SAM. Later, Whiteside's team came up with another way to achieve the same effect, only this time the idea was to make a kind of mold in the shape of the film you wanted to create and put it on top of a surface like gold and fill it with the substance of the film. After a short while, remove the mold and you got yourself an SAM with a particular shape. There's a lot going on here, so to recap, by controlling the exact shape and structure of an SAM, we can create surfaces which hold specific biological molecules in place, and that makes it easier to study them, but also to use them, like in a DNA array. Better still, SAMs made with particular patterns can hold all kinds of useful and important molecules on surfaces. Base makers, for instance, can often be attacked by the body at the point where the electrical contacts are in touch with your organs, because the immune system identifies it as something foreign to the body. The resulting inflammation does a lot more harm than good. But by coating the contact points with SAMs, they can be cloaked with anti-inflammatory molecules that prevent the body from going haywire. It's a little like an invisibility cloak for medical equipment. Nothing to see here. Just normal heart pieces. I could keep going. But hopefully you have seen that the ability to stick a thing to a surface has an incredible range of applications from medical devices to consumer electronics. In 2022, Sagiv, Nuzzo, Alara, and Whitesides were all awarded the Kavli Prize in Nanoscience for the remarkable tools they worked to develop in creating and studying SAMs. At the time of this video, there are already 10,000 patents involving SAMs from chemical sensors to solar cells. So at least on the nanoscale, we have only begun to scratch the surface. Or at least build on it. Thanks to the Kavli Prize for partnering with us on this video. The Kavli Prize honors scientists for breakthroughs in astrophysics, nanoscience, and neuroscience, transforming our understanding of the big, the small, and the complex. And now that you've learned about the Nanoscience Award, you can check out the research that earned the 2022 Kavli Prize in neuroscience and astrophysics.